Hey everyone, welcome back to Classroom Hatchery Television. This is our last episode before we release our fish into two different restoration streams. We'll be getting our fish ready for this exciting event. Our guest presenter this week is Maribeth Burley, or MB as she likes to be called. MB runs this center, the OFAH Mario Cordellucci Hunting and Fishing Heritage Center in Peterborough where we've been running this program. Today, she is going to be speaking to us about biodiversity in Ontario. Let's have a look at our fish first. Hatchery number one, filter is running, air pump is running, and our temperature is four degrees Celsius. The elven look healthy. We want them to start using up their yolk sacs a little bit faster though, so that they are at the fry stage when we release them into the stream in a few weeks. We also want to try and match the water temperature of the tank with the water temperature of the stream when they are released. I will soon start slowly warming the water by a degree every few days. If we time it right, these fish will be just finished their yolk sacs when we release them and we won't feed them like we are doing with the fish in tank number two. Hatchery number two, the filter and the air pump are running and the temperature is 12 degrees Celsius. So we've now increased the temperature and we've increased the amount of light and this has made the fish a lot more active. And I came in here two days ago to check on them and I thought these fish are ready to eat. And so I put a bit of this food in there. This food is, it's a mixture of, of fats and proteins and oils, and that's, this will really help the fish grow. I saw that they looked like they were ready to start to eat, so I fed them a bit of this food and they started to feed immediately. And uh, so this is a really good sign. Let's see if we can, we can watch them feed a little bit. I'm gonna take just a small pinch of food and put that into the water. The fish appear to smell the food in the water, becoming slightly excited. They swim towards the pieces of food that they see floating in the water and grab it with their mouths. If they like it, they eat it. And if they don't, they spit it out. Of course, in the natural environment, they would not be eating this type of food, but would be hunting for tiny little invertebrates that would be floating in the water. Feeding is a new activity for these fish, and it does not appear that all of our fish have started to feed yet. I am feeding them every couple of days and watching the amount of food that they are not eating. Hunting and Fishing Heritage Centre. The centre has been the home base for the Virtual Classroom Hatchery program for the past few months, and during unprecedented times we are happy to host. As the centre remains closed to the general public, we too are offering virtual lessons on a variety of conservation education topics, so be sure to check us out too. I have been the Conservation Education Coordinator here at the Heritage Centre for a little over 10 years. The Heritage Centre opened in April 2010 and I've been here ever since. Growing up in North Bay, my family loved the outdoors, often camping and canoeing as a kid. 
as a member of Girl Guides and Scouts Canada, I furthered my love for the outdoors by enrolling in various programs at Sir Sanford Fleming College. I then transferred to Trent University to obtain my biology degree and then went back home to North Bay to obtain my Bachelor of Education at Nipissing University. Volunteering was a big part of my experience with Scouts. Volunteering allows you to learn more, more about yourself, more about a particular field. And as an employer now myself hiring summer staff, I'll often flip to a candidate's volunteer section to see where they've given their free time. The Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters is an organization that values their volunteers. The Heritage Centre is a place where visitors come to discover their own connection to our hunting and fishing heritage. We've hosted thousands of students through for curriculum linked field trips and as a multi-use facility we offer day camps, birthday parties and youth programs that allow participants to discover their role within conservation. Which brings us to the question, what is biodiversity? Biodiversity, short for biological diversity, is defined as the variety of species at all levels of classification within an ecosystem and the variety of ecosystems globally or within a certain geographic area. One way that I remember what the word biodiversity means is I take a look at the middle letter, V. V stands for variety. And the higher the number of birds and animals and plants and fish and insects, the healthier the ecosystem. And a healthy ecosystem is a resilient ecosystem, able to withstand or recover from difficult conditions like drought or floods or invasive species or disease. The OFAH Heritage Centre is the perfect place to come and discover more about Ontario's biodiversity and more about our ecozones. Ecozones are the highest level of ecosystem classification, classifying our province and further our country in such a way that help ecologists and biologists further understand, monitor, and evaluate our ecosystems. To further explore Ontario's biodiversity, join me as we take a closer look at three different exhibits representing three out of the four ecozones present here in Ontario. Behind me, you'll see the Hudson Bay Lowlands Ecozone. This ecozone is characterized by mostly wetlands, but also supports boreal forest, subarctic forest, tundra, tidal marshes, as well as lakes and rivers. And one species that calls the Hudson Bay Lowlands Ecozone home is the woodland caribou. There are two main populations of woodland caribou in Ontario, and it's the boreal or forest dwelling population that is currently listed as threatened. This means that the species does live wild in Ontario, and is not quite endangered, but is likely to become endangered if steps are not taken to address the factors threatening it. One of the main reasons caribou are listed is because of habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. Caribou are an incredibly important species to the Indigenous people of Ontario, and Indigenous communities of Northern Ontario play a vital role in our province's caribou conservation plan. This further emphasizes the critical connection between healthy ecosystems flourishing with biodiversity and healthy communities of people. Behind me, you'll see the Ontario Shield Ecozone. This is the largest ecozone in Ontario, covering 61% of the province. It's characterized by mainly forest, with the remainder covered by wetlands, lakes, and ponds. Two species that call the Ontario Shield Ecozone home include wolves and coyotes. What do wolves and coyotes look like? First, I'll point out the similarities between the two. Both wolves and coyotes are members of the family Canidae, which is actually the same family that your pet dog belongs to. It's hard to believe, but they are distant relatives. Wolves and coyotes are carnivores, they are predators, and they are consumers. 
I've got an example here of a wolf pelt and a coyote pelt. And they're similar in the sense that their colors can vary widely. Anything from a gray to a black to a brown to almost a reddish in color. Both have very long, thick guard hairs that help to protect the thinner under layer of under fur, which is right next to the wolf's or coyote's skin. And now to discuss the differences between a wolf and a coyote. Can anybody guess what's beside me here in the exhibit? Raise your right arm if you think it's a wolf and raise your left arm if you think it's a coyote. That's right, it's a coyote. A coyote's scientific name is Canis latrans, which translates to barking dog. Coyotes are generally smaller than a wolf, with adult males weighing up to 18 kilograms, which is about as heavy as nine bags of sugar. Their muzzle is narrow and pointed, and their ears are much closer together. Their ears are also pointed. Coyote tracks are much narrower than wolf tracks. When it comes to wolves in Ontario, the main species is Canis lupus. However, there are a few genetically different subspecies of wolves. For example, the Eastern wolf, also known as the Algonquin wolf, whose scientific name is Canis lupus lycaon. Wolves are indeed larger than coyotes, with adult males weighing up to 29 kilograms, which is almost as heavy as 15 bags of sugar. Their head is much broader and their ears have rounded tips. And behind me, we have the Mixed Wood Plains Ecozone. And while this is one of the smaller ecozones, covering only about 8% of the province, this is where most of Ontario's human population live. This ecozone is characterized by rich soils and a moderate climate. But this ecozone has seen several changes over the past few hundred years, changing from forests and wetlands and prairie habitat to a landscape that is now dominated by agriculture and by settlement. Despite this, the Mixed Wood Plains Ecozone is still one of Canada's most biologically diverse ecozones. One species that calls the Mixed Wood Plains Ecozone home is the Eastern Wild Turkey. <laughs> story behind the return of Ontario's eastern wild turkey. First of all, raise your hand if you have ever, ever, ever seen a wild turkey. And depending on where you're watching this from in Ontario, chances are you have seen a wild turkey. Well, believe it or not, just a little over 40 years ago, there were absolutely no wild turkey left in Ontario. At the turn of the century in the 1900s, eastern wild turkey were extirpated from Ontario. The turkey disappeared from Ontario because of unregulated market harvest and habitat loss. Remember, turkeys need mixed hardwood forest habitat. So, as settlers moved in to clear the land and make way for farming, critical turkey habitat was lost. The Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, a keystone partner, along with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and others, worked hard to restore vital turkey habitat and reintroduce the eastern wild turkey in the 1980s. The wild turkey was reintroduced not just as another bird to hunt, but to restore biodiversity. The return of Ontario's eastern wild turkey is truly a conservation success story. Thanks, Ben, for the chance to share. Don't forget to check out our virtual lessons at hfhc.ca. 
Best of luck with the rest of the Classroom Hatchery series. And Ben, I'll pass it back to you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for checking out another segment of Fishy Facts. I'm Johnny Nene. This week, we're gonna talk about a massive fish from the ocean, the ocean sunfish. There are five species that belong to the Molidae family. They are commonly called molas, and the ocean sunfish is the largest among them. In fact, ocean sunfish are the world's largest bony fish. They can reach lengths up to 3.1 meters, heights up to 4.3 meters, and weigh up to 5,000 pounds. They are found in temperate and tropical oceans across the globe. They spend most of their time in the epipelagic zone, which is the top 200 meters of water where sunlight can penetrate, allowing for algae to photosynthesize. Ocean sunfish will, however, dive to depths over 600 meters in search of food. They spend about half their time sunbathing at the ocean's surface to warm up after diving to colder depths. This allows them to regulate their body temperature. Molas have a large dorsal fin and anal fin with much smaller pectoral fins. They also have a clavis rather than a traditional tail fin, which functions more as a rudder for steering than like a normal tail for propulsion. They feed primarily on jellyfish, but also consume zooplankton. Ocean sunfish will sometimes consume plastic bags, mistaking them for jellyfish, which causes them to slowly starve to death by blocking their digestive tract. They are slow swimmers and are relatively defenseless to predator attacks and can sometimes fall prey to large sharks, orcas, or sea lions. Sea lions have been known to rip the fins off of ocean sunfish and leave them to die and sink to the bottom of the ocean. The ocean sunfish's greatest defense is their size and they can grow rapidly, gaining over a pound a day and so quickly outgrow their predator's ability to consume them. Ocean sunfish commonly become infested with skin parasites, and they may have up to 40 species of parasite on an individual. However, they engage in symbiotic relationships with other species to rid themselves of these parasites. Ocean sunfish will hang out near reefs or kelp forests, where wrasses or emperor angelfish will eat the parasites. The fish get an easy meal, while the ocean sunfish are rid of their parasites. For more stubborn parasites, ocean sunfish may leap above the water surface to try to detach them. They will also flap about at the ocean surface to try to entice gulls to pick off any remaining parasites. Ocean sunfish lay more eggs than any other animal and can lay over 300 million eggs at one time. After hatching, the fry are only two millimeters long and they stay in small schools until they are large enough to venture out on their own. Ocean sunfish are sometimes considered a nuisance because their immense size can damage fishing nets. In several Asian countries, some species of mola are considered a delicacy and they are even used in traditional Chinese medicines. Thanks again for checking out this week's segment of Fishy Facts. I hope you guys enjoyed learning about the ocean sunfish and be sure to check out next week's segment. Thanks everybody. Thanks MB and Johnny for your presentations today. Folks, we only have one episode left in which we will collect our fish out of the tanks, take them to one of our restoration streams and release them into the wild. I hope that you'll join us. Until then, Keep on swimming upstream.